ladies. That was very, very, very lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, well, praise the Lord. Um, today, you haven't noticed it, but I think maybe you might have noticed with uh, us singing A Mighty Fortress that October 31st is Halloween. No. <laughs> Re Reformation Day. And this is Reformation Sunday. And in God's providence, it couldn't have been. We, I don't have to even leave the text that we're working in. It is the very doctrine upon which the Reformation was founded. Justification by faith alone. You know, faith that we cannot see, touch, or smell is the most real thing people live by. What you put your faith in or believe in is central to every human being's existence. We all believe something. We all trust in something. We're all living for something. Faith is the difference between life and death. Faith is the difference between eternal life and eternal death. Salvation by, by faith alone, as I said, was the foundation stone of the Reformation. When we remember the Reformation, we need to be thankful, first and foremost, though, the Reformation is about the Lord. <laughs> the Reformation is, we're going to remember Martin Luther today, who is one of my favorite uh, Reformation characters. He's the father of the Reformation, and he's, he's quite an interesting guy, this world with devils filled, uh, a real medieval man. But we have to remember, when we're thinking about this idea of justification by faith alone, it's faith alone because it's founded on God alone, who through grace alone, grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. Amen. What the Reformation restored is a right understanding of salvation. Uh, you wouldn't think that the church would get, get deterred from what does salvation look like but the Roman Catholic Church, which was the universal church at that time, there was a mixture, a mixture of faith and a mixture of works. They didn't even have the word of God in the, the common man's hand. They needed a priest to uh, exegete the scriptures of which many of these guys weren't even saved. It was just a crazy, crazy time in which that the Reformation was, was birthed. But the key doctrine, as I said, for the Reformation was justification by faith alone. Dr. James White, the good, the, in his book, The God Who Justifies, puts it this way. From this principle of sola scriptura came what might be called the central material doctrine of the Reformation, justification by faith. When scripture was allowed to speak with its full voice, the doctrine of God's free, and gracious justification of sinful men based upon the completed work of Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary stood in stark contrast to the teaching of medieval Catholicism, a doctrine based upon human action, meritorious works, indulgences, and penance. <clears throat> so there's so much I thought about when thinking about Reformation Sunday but us being right in the idea of justification by faith alone, in that one paragraph we looked at last week, and we'll look at a little bit more today, those dominoes that have fell down through history that found their uh, uh, terminus in Christ, in God, the righteousness of God that was expressed in obedience of Christ to be that propitiation, to, to defer God's wrath, that was meant for sinful men and women and to have that wrath fall on Christ. That paragraph. We, got, we talked about that last week, that, that God is the source of the righteousness, Christ is the ground of the righteousness, and faith is the means of the righteousness. We just started to talk about the means of how men, women, and children are justified, and it's through faith. So today, as Paul takes us a bit further, we want to look specifically at this justification by faith alone. So like I said, if we're going to think about the Reformation, and we're going to think about that key doctrine, we have to begin to think about that curious guy, Martin Luther. Martin Luther was born in uh, Eisleben, Germany, on November 10th, 1483, and he lived during a time when superstition and fears 
were very real. When he in that song says, the world with devils filled, Martin Luther believed there was devils behind every bush. That, that the life that he grew up in, in his understanding of scripture and of who God was, was a very superstitious time. Back then you had the Black Plague that killed thousands and thousands and thousands of people. These folks lived in a culture that was so different from ours, and they were marked so by superstition. One of the most uh, incredible stories about Martin Luther is when he was traveling from his college at the University of Erfurt in around 1505. He was there working towards his master's degree, and he was traveling home to see mom and dad by horseback. So Martin Luther's traveling home, he's in the woods, and all of a sudden things get darker and darker and darker. There's flashes of lightning. I suspect the wind is kicking up, and Martin Luther is growing more and more fearful. The father of the Reformation, this guy we think of as courageous, was just a, a regular man touched by the type of fear and, and, and things that affect all of us. But at his lowest moment, at that darkest moment, as lightning is striking, he's afraid that either he's going to be struck by lightning, this horse is going to throw him from, the, from, from its back, and somehow he might die. He cries out to God that, Lord God, if you get me through this, I will give my life to become a monk and dedicate my life to your service. Well, in God's providence, he made it through that lightning storm, and he indeed did give his life to become a monk. Monks were ascetic. They gave up everything they owned and turned it over, and they gave up all of their worldly goods. They'd give them a burlap clothing to wear that was scratchy because they wanted to inflict themselves so that somehow they might please God. So Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, giving himself, as I said, to the monastery, the Augustinian monastery there in Erfurt. And again, it's just indicative of the times of Roman Catholicism. Justification was nothing that was free or all of God. They knew about Christ. They knew about the cross, but it was always a mixture. It was a mixture of faith and a mixture of what man can do to uh, secure his own salvation. So, of course, as we celebrate October 31st, which now we know is Haley's birthday, right? <laughs> and it's also a day that you may go trick-or-treating, but October 31st is far more important in historical memory for the day that, that Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses Amen. to the castle door at Wittenberg, which sparked the whole Reformation. And the very doctrine at the heart of that was this idea of faith alone, uh, which brings justification. So if you would stand with me, I want to read that text again, that paragraph, and then our text for today. And maybe just as you're getting standing there, like I said, I've got these wonderful notes that the children, uh, that they, they, they take, and these were notes taken last week during our sermon, and these will really give you an idea of an overview and a review of what's happened. Justification is completely free to us because of God's grace. God loves us so much, he sent his son to die for us. Jesus is the propitiation. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. He took the wrath of God for us, wicked sinners that deserve to die. Amen. God, who is just, can justify the unjust through faith. The source is God. Jesus is the answer. Redemption is only powered by Jesus Christ. Faith is the most real thing you're going to have. Christ died for the wicked. And then finally, faith. And this is where we really ended last week and what we'll really focus on today. Faith is the only real thing, even more real than life. And it's actually life-giving. So we're in Romans chapter 3. I want to read that ultimate paragraph and then just the little bit that we're going to cover today. I'm going to read Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 27. Romans 3, 21 through 27. 
But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just in the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, today we come to your word in great appreciation and thanks, Lord God, that you have revealed this most wonderful plan, a plan by which wicked, sinful men can come into a right standing with a perfectly holy God. Although, Lord God, we that believe in and of ourselves deserve death, hell, wrath, instead we get life, heaven, and forgiveness. Father, we thank you today as we look at this portion of scripture, Father, that we might have clear in our hearts and our minds what exactly the means of salvation looks like and exactly what part we play in our salvation. What is faith and how do we rightly apply it, Father? God, I just pray that you'd help me, Lord, that I might be able to preach this in such a way that you would be glorified, Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds that we might truly be able to uh, understand your word. And then, Lord God, by your grace and mercy, that we might be able to walk it out by faith. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Basically, though, at two points, I had had a grand idea that I was going to go all the way to the end of the chapter here, but I kind of really got stopped up with this idea, and I think rightly here on Reformation Sunday, of justification by faith alone. And this idea of justification, we looked really clear at it last week, the idea that man who is sinful can be justified, just as if he had never sinned. Man who is unrighteous and lawless can be made right with God, can have a righteousness. But as we know, it's a righteousness that is alien to him. It's a righteousness that's been won fully in Christ. And then that we need to walk it out and apply it by faith. So I'm going to see two points. Faith alone abolishes pride and faith alone justifies. Uh, Romans 3.27 there says, where is boasting then? Where is boasting? You know what's hard, again, here, Paul is addressing those Jews who felt they had much to boast in. They were God's chosen people. They had the law of God. They felt there was something special about them. But honestly, if you just read what Paul has said here in this paragraph, he's again addressing what he's been telling them. Where is boasting? Where is pride when it comes to salvation, when it comes to a relationship with this perfect and righteous God. Because we as men, listen, there's got to be something I bring to the table. There's got to be something that in this that man has done. But Paul has been truly explicating the fact that Jew and Gentile alike, that they are all guilty of sin. They have all fallen short. And that now, though, being made right with a holy God, it's all of Christ. It's all of God. Uh, haven't we seen that it's a righteousness of God? You see, as we said last week, it's not a righteousness of man. It's a righteousness of God for a good reason. There's absolutely nothing we could bring to the table. We have to be perfectly holy. So the, the fact of this propitiation that God has turned away his wrath 
by the blood of the cross in Christ, that that is the, the, the way that we are, are justified, and then the means being faith, being faith, that we apply this great gift of God. What Jesus has accomplished, we apply through faith. So, but in faith, man, of course, we're so prideful. There has to be something we can do that's part of this. But if you get anything right out of that paragraph, man has nothing to bring to the table, nothing to bring to the party. So Paul's saying, where is boasting? Where is pride? Wait, wait, we get saved, then we do do things, don't we? We start to go to church on Sunday, we start to act differently, we start to be a little bit better. Even this faith, right? I mean, I believed in God. There's something special about me. There is just absolutely nothing special about us. There's only one thing special about man. We're dead in trespasses and sins. <laughs> absolutely dead. But God in his mercy reaches down to grab us. That's why when we look at Jews who were very religious and we consider Martin Luther who grew up in the Catholic Church and the Catholic Church was very much given to religion. They did believe in Jesus. They did believe in the cross, but they also believed there was so much that you as a person had to bring to the table, that we had to do something to please God, that it wasn't all enough just what God has done in his righteousness, in grace, in Christ, but there's something more. And it's so important as a Christian, or just as a person, if you're trying to noodle this whole thing through, to recognize that in and of ourselves, there's nothing to be proud of. There's nothing to boast in. There's nothing that we add to this salvation. There's nothing we bring to the table, as I said. It's all of God, and faith is, as, as um, Schaefer would say, it's the empty hands of faith that we bring. It's completely receiving from God. He saved us gloriously, but now we must add our part, faith plus works. There's something, we always feel like you've got to do something. Anybody, you ever get, like, someone calls up and says, hey, listen, I've got this free gift for you, right? And you go, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> now, all they have to say is, I've got something free for you, and we're just hanging up on them, right? And, but that's the nature of man. We feel as though if there's something that's been given to us, that, that, that nothing's free, that we, we have to do something to add to our salvation, or we have to do something in a religious motion, and that, again, is I think Luther is so instructive because the nature of man is such that we feel as though we need to cooperate with God for our salvation. I know as I started to talk earlier in Romans that, that, that we're dead in trespasses and sins, that salvation is the power of God to deliver, that it's the righteousness of God. All of the, that we said, but then I said, of course, we're going to do works. There's going to be works that come out of that but those works are going to be something that, that comes from God as well. That, that even our works are just going to be a response to what God has done. But we have got to be cautious to understand that faith that saves us is a faith that is completely and totally alone. Luther said this, Truly, I was a pious monk and followed the rules of my order more strictly than I can tell. If ever monk had got to heaven by monkery, I had been that monk. In this, all the monks of my acquaintance will bear me witness. Had the thing continued much longer, I had become a martyr unto death through vigils, prayers, reading, and other labors. In Martin Luther's heart to please God is the same thing that happens even to Protestants who have grown out of the Protestant Reformation. That, that know that key doctrine is justification by faith alone, but man just wants to work. We want to please God. We have to know today there's nothing we can do to please God. There's nothing we can do to earn or add to that salvation. Faith is something, we'll look more deeply into what faith is, but faith 
it, even our faith, we know, is completely a gift from God. But the, the, the temptation is to add to our salvation. At this time, Martin Luther, he was trying, listen, he feared God. He wanted to be right with God. He, he did all he could in order to, to attain up to this. And one of those other doctrines, when you think about that the Reformation is based on the doctrine of justification by faith alone, I think you can also say the Reformation was birthed out of the heart of Martin Luther, who wanted assurance of salvation. He wanted some way to be right with God, and he tried ever so hard to do it. Well, praise the Lord, he didn't get there through monkery, but it was that thing that kept pushing him forward. Maybe you're here today and you think, you know what, I, I can please God. I'll just be a little bit better. I I'll be a nicer person today. You know, I was messed up yesterday, but you know, God, like we said last week, maybe he can just wink at sin. Maybe he can overlook sin. That's not how it works. And you could never be good enough to earn God's forgiveness or righteousness. And if you've ever trusted Christ and you're trying to add to it, he's going to cause you to stumble and fall because you cannot add to that salvation. The other thing he said is a tender conscience, this is about Martin Luther, a tender conscience led Luther to regard the smallest fault as a great sin. No sooner had he discovered it than he strove to expiate it by the severest mortifications. This, however, had no other effect than to convince him of the utter ineffect uh, in, in efficacy of all human remedies. He said, I tormented myself to death in order to procure peace with God in my troubled heart and agitated conscience, but surrounded with fearful darkness, I nowhere found it. Praise the Lord <laughs> that Martin Luther did not find it that way because it was the trouble and the torment of Martin Luther's soul that made God use just one little monk to turn the whole redemptive history on its ear that had fallen down to a place where scripture had been lost to the common man, where this doctrine of justification by faith alone was, was unknown at the time, other than just a few folks. But Luther would discover in this portion of scripture that, that, that there was faith alone, that it abolishes all pride. We cannot add one thing to our salvation. Where is boasting then, Paul says? It's excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Righteousness is secured apart from the law. Righteous, the righteousness Paul has made clear is of God by faith alone. It's completely by grace, which is a gift of God as we saw. It says there in verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. But understanding what faith is, understanding what true belief is, you have to understand that it is a complete gift. We know in Ephesians that we're saved by grace through faith. So there has to be that means by which we're saved. That means by which, which is so wonderful, I think, as someone who believes in the doctrines of grace, who believes in a sovereign God, that you have to understand you in and of yourself bring nothing to your salvation. All we bring is sin and, 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 and depravity. R.C. Sproul said about Luther, so Luther was forced to ask the, ask the question, what is saving faith? He described saving faith, Luther, as fetus viva, a living faith, a vital faith, a faith that was beating with a heart pulsating after God. Faith takes our focus off of ourselves. True saving faith takes our focus off. We, all we see in ourselves is sin, but then because of that sin, we're turned to God, the God who is this God of righteousness, this God who is made a way in Christ that we can be forgiven. It's, this type of faith is an emptying faith. It's a faith that causes us to look to him alone. Where is boasting? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by this law of faith. It eliminates 
all that we have to look to ourselves. The temptation of man, of the Jew, the Roman Catholic, to add to this salvation is clearly by God and through God and from God. Faith is a simple means, but it should only point us back to God alone. One of the, the solas that came out of the, uh, the, the Reformation was sola deo gloria, glory to God alone. If we rightly understand how we bring nothing and that there's no pride in and of ourselves, it'll cause us to love God more fully. Now these works that will pour out of us will be because of this love for a God who has done so much for us. Paul says it this way in Corinthians, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. <coughs> Don't we all think that we're mighty and that we're noble? But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But that's the temptation to glory and to boast in some way. It ought not to be so. And then Paul would say, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who, because, because, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. That's what salvation and justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone, should produce in us. A real worship and appreciation and living for God alone in that glory of God. Uh, if you look, at, as I said in Ephesians, we know where it ends, for by grace you are saved, but we have to recognize the focus. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. It's all of grace, it's all of God, it's all of mercy. Where is boasting? What do you have to be prideful for today? What do you have to boast in when it comes to your salvation before a perfectly holy God? Nothing. If, if, if this gospel doesn't humble you, you, you don't got it. You, you didn't get it. You don't understand it. Because it's all of God. And it's all of mercy. The, the Amplified puts it this way. Then what becomes of our pride and our boasting? It is excluded, banished, ruled out entirely. On what principle? On the principle of doing good deeds? No, but on the principle of faith. Again, Schaefer would say that faith is empty. Your hands are empty. All you do is receive. It's all a complete gift. There's nothing you use these hands for to work towards a salvation. It's a complete reception. And faith is the means. It is the vehicle. John Stott said it this way. It is only by faith in Christ, which is why we should boast in him, not in ourselves. There is indeed something fundamentally anomalous, not normal, not right, about Christians who boast in themselves. As there is something essentially authentic, appropriate, and attractive about their boasting in Christ. All boasting is excluded except boasting in Christ. Praising, not boasting, is the characteristic activity of justified believers and will be throughout eternity. So let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no room for boasting when you're justified freely by grace. Through faith. It's all of God. You know, yesterday we've been talking about our brother Ralph, and, and, and we've all watched him deteriorate before our very eyes. And his, his outer man has dwindled, and I went to visit him. All he is now is just skin and bones, and he's as weak as he could be, and he can barely even talk anymore. But what amazed me is <laughs> I went into him yesterday, and I'm sitting talking to him. I couldn't really understand even what he was saying, and I, I decided I was going to thank him 
for everything he's been, the relationship him and I have had together. I was going to express to him my love and appreciation. So I started to go into to my, my spiel, and I could just see that he was upset with me. <laughs> Something was bothering him. I, I said, do you want me to stop talking? You know, and, and he made it clear, yeah, shut up and get out of here. That was basically what I got from Ralph. So, so, so this grand thing that was going to be thanking him for what he's done in my life, I go in the other room and I told him, I said, Barb, this is going on. She goes, James, don't take it personally. Well, you all know me. I take everything personally. <laughs> so I sat down there and you could hear him in the other room. She had a baby monitor so she could hear and he yelled, Barb. It's the only thing you could really hear that Ralph is saying is when he would say Barb. So she goes in there, and he comes in, and he says, Pastor, Ralph wants to see you. And so I went in there, and what was amazing is that I could hear him and understand him. He said, James, I don't want to hear you saying thank you to me or appreciating what I've done, because there's nothing I've done that hasn't been for the glory of God. And Ralph gets it. And that's what the believer must do. We must get it, that it's not about us. It's about God. And there he was, ready to go and see the Lord, and all he could think about was he was disturbed that I was thanking him and praising him. He's like, praise the Lord. But then he did encourage me. He said, thank you for being my pastor. So <laughs> God gave me a little, a little cookie so I could go away and not feel so bad. But honestly, when we think about justification through faith alone, we have to recognize that it's to God's glory. May he be praised for what he does for us. You look at verse 21, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Where is boasting? Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. Where is boasting? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith. Where is boasting? To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just in the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where is boasting? Justification by faith alone is all of God. And we ought to boast, but we only boast in God. That this faith that we've been given, it's only a gift. R.C. Sproul, if you're going to talk about Reformation, you, you want to hear stuff about Luther, listen to R.C. Paul is saying that the doctrine of salvation, which comes to us graciously through the work of Christ, banishes boasting from the Christian life. If our justification was even in part based upon good works, we would have something to boast about. It is the concept of justification by faith alone that crushes the voice of human arrogance and pride. How often, though, are we as Christians prideful and arrogant? But God, who is merciful and gracious to us, Amen. should cause us to be those that live lives of appreciation and praise. Because you know what? We were all headed to eternal darkness. We were all living in the kingdom of Satan and were serving him and living sinfully evil and wicked lives that would end up in eternal damnation. But God, who is merciful, the gracious righteousness of God intervened on our part and delivered us. So finally, just to look at faith alone justifies Verse 28 says, Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. So here Paul again concludes that a man is justified by faith alone with no mixture of works. We could never have obeyed the law perfectly, which as we know is what God requires of man. If there was going to be a righteousness that was going to come from us, it would have been we obeyed in every point. James says if you break it in one point, you're guilty of all of it. So again, Paul's making clear there's absolutely nothing we can do to bring our justification. The law won't bring it about, and, and any mixture of works won't bring it about. We know that the law, that first work of the law, is to show us we need Christ. 
It's to show us that we are totally lost and broken and unable to live up to that standard so that we might come to trust the living God. If we're going to talk about Reformation, we have to talk about probably my favorite reformer other than Martin Luther, and that's John Kelvin. If you want to read something, read the Institutes of Christian Religion in your private devotions. But Kelvin says this about saving faith. What is saving faith? Saving faith, that faith that really makes you right with God, is going to be a faith that you realize has nothing to do with you. It's going to be a humbling. You're going to be humbled at the feet of God, trusting only in what he has done. Uh, Kelvin puts it this way. First, God lays down for us through the law what we should do. If we then fail in any part of it, that dreadful sentence of eternal death, which it pronounces, will rest upon us. Secondly, it is not only hard, but above our strength and beyond all of our abilities to fulfill the law to the letter. Thus, if we look to ourselves only and ponder what condition we deserve, no trace of good hope will remain. But cast away by God, we shall lie under eternal death. Thirdly, it has been explained that there is but one means of liberation that can rescue us from such a miserable calamity, the appearance of Christ the Redeemer, through whose hand the Heavenly Father, pitying us out of his infinite goodness and mercy, willed to help us. If indeed, with firm faith, we embrace this mercy and rest in it with steadfast hope. You have to understand your scriptures. We have to go a little bit deeper than just a cursory look at what God's saying in scripture. There's no easy believism. There, there's God bringing the heart to life and then causing us to search these wonderful things so that we might truly trust in him. This idea of faith. What is faith? Faith alone, as I said, is the starting point. Justification, and we're going to look much more at this, is imputed or credited to our account because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. We may not see faith, but it is the only thing that is more real than, than the world we look at, than, than the, the pews you sit on. Faith needs to be more real to you and true if you're going to embrace what God has done for you. Uh, I, all I can do to think of it is to look at Hebrews. Open up quickly to Hebrews with me. And I'm just finishing up. Remember, we had a lot of, uh, of things earlier. Jean told me, she goes, James, if you've got something, preach it. Don't feel like you've got to apologize. So, so I'm going to try not to apologize for preaching a little bit longer, even when you're looking at me with your smirks. <laughs> <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. I just want to try to think a little bit more about faith. What is faith? This thing that's, that's very real. Uh, the, re the writer of Hebrews, who I think is Paul, says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then again it says right there, For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. So what he's saying is that faith, there is substance to our faith, and it's the substance of things that are hoped for, that, that, that all of what God has done, his righteousness and what he has done in Christ, causes us to embrace by faith a real hope of salvation and deliverance, that it is really evidence and something that we can stake a claim to. For it by the elders obtained a good testimony. Verse 3, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. That even God created the whole world by the word of his faith, right. just speaking it into existence. Right. That, that this faith that we need to try to get our hands around is something very tangible, very real. If faith is not the foundation of your life, if the foundation of justification by faith alone is not the foundation of your life, you have no foundation at all. We know that Christ said that he's that chief cornerstone, but this faith, what are we grappling with? And then very curiously in verse 5 and 6, it talks about Enoch. And I want to go back to Enoch. In Genesis 5, 21, stay in Hebrews there, but in Genesis 5, 21 and 24, it says, Enoch lived 
65 years and begat Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And then it says, and Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. What made God take Enoch? What made it so that Enoch didn't die like you and I? What was special about Enoch? Was it works? Was it he was a specially good guy? No, he was born in Adam. He was a sinner. Hebrews gives us a little insight. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. How do you think he pleased God? By works? By doing something special? No. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Enoch is in that whole hall of faith there, and that's what made him special. He somehow understood before Christ came what faith looked like what trusting God looked like. Martin Luther himself, if we understand, you think about Martin Luther trying to add to his faith works, but Martin Luther would finally come to faith, and it's quite a story, but he said this, although I, I was a holy and irreproachable monk, listen, Martin Luther was a good guy. He was as good as they come. He, he, was a, he wasn't only a good guy, he was a Bible scholar, he had a master's degree. He was teaching Bible at one of the colleges there in Wittenberg. But it, all of that was nothing till he came to this real truth. Although I was a holy and irreproachable monk, my conscience was full of trouble and anguish. I could not bear the words justice of God. I loved not the just and holy God who punishes sinners. I was filled with secret rage against him and hated him because not satisfied with terrifying us, his miserable creatures, already lost by original sin with his law and the miseries of life, he still further increased our torment by the gospel. He read the New Testament and didn't see grace and mercy. He saw more judgment. When he saw in Romans they talked about the righteousness of God, it was this God he didn't really know. It was this God that he thought was just a, a merciless a destructive God who is wrathful and angry. Listen, God is wrathful and angry against sin. But this same God is merciful to us in Christ. Hallelujah. But when, by the Spirit of God, I comprehended these words, when I learned how the sinner's justification proceeds from the pure mercy of the Lord by means of faith, then I felt myself revived like a new man and entered it doors into the very paradise of God. From that time also, I beheld the precious sacred volume with new eyes. I went over all the Bible and collected a great number of passages which, which taught me what the work of God was. And as I had previously with all my heart hated the words, justice of God, so from that time I began to, began to esteem them and love them as the words most sweet and most consoling. In truth, these words were to me the true gate of paradise. Once he fully and finally understood that the justice of God is only a gift, that it's only mercy, that, that, that if God is merciful to open you up, listen, Martin Luther had no trouble realizing he was a sinner. He, 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 he despised himself. He knew he was wicked. But when God opened his heart to see that the justice of God, that God is just and the justifier of them that put faith in Christ, his life was turned upside down. The rest of Martin Luther's life was a testament to him doing one thing. I'm sold out to this God who saved me. He didn't care. He was going to obey God rather than man. Even when it came up to the point where in, in, uh, at the Diet of Worms, that he would have potentially died, he didn't care. He goes, listen, I don't care what men say, popes, they make mistakes, but I, my conscience is tied to the word of God. I must obey God. 
If this God saves you and delivers you, you're going to find that now you're living for him. Not because you want to please him by your good works, but because you want to love him because of the love and mercy he's poured out on us. That's the real truth of the Reformation. It's about man realizing in and of ourselves we're useless, but that God has provided all we need mercifully through Christ, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. Let's come up and sing our last song. I want to read in closing a prayer of John Kelvin. Uh, someone shared with me. It's actually on the G3 uh, website this week. And so join me in prayer. O oh Lord, with heartfelt sorrow, we repent and deplore our offenses. We condemn ourselves and our evil ways with true penitence, entreating that your grace may relieve our distress. Be pleased to have compassion on us, O oh, most gracious God, Father of all mercies, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And as you remove our guilt and our pollution, grant us the daily increase of the grace of your Holy Spirit, that acknowledging from our innermost hearts our own unrighteousness, we may be touched with sorrow that shall work true repentance, and that, mortifying all sins within us, your Spirit may produce the fruits of holiness and righteousness, well-pleasing in your sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.